Hello everyone, welcome back uh, to our lecture on the hydrologic cycle. Uh, we're going to continue uh, talking about permafrost. So permafrost is just ground that's been frozen for over two years. So the water that's in the pore spaces is frozen um, because the temperature is pretty low. Um, and on top of that uh, frozen layer, you usually have what's called the active layer, which is the um, layer of the soil in which you have seasonal thawing and freezing. And um, permafrost kind of comes in two different varieties. So there's continuous permafrost and then there's discontinuous permafrost. So continuous just means that the entire landscape has a continuous layer of um, frozen soil, whereas discontinuous is generally in warmer areas where you have kind of a patchwork of uh, frozen soil where there's some areas that um, it's thawed out. Um, and you can see here this is a map of continuous versus discontinuous um, permafrost with the continuous in purple um, taking up higher latitudes and colder regions whereas the discontinuous permafrost um, occurring in some um, lower latitude areas as well as in the Himalayas as well. Um, and then you can get to um, sporadic permafrost and isolated permafrost, which is just very small patches um, in particular co cold regions of that area. Um, so this permafrost area has been steadily declining um, over the past several years. We can see that, that it's already declined um, significantly since the 1980s. Um, and climate models predict that the amount of uh, area that's permafrost will be significantly decreasing due to climate change. So we have um, these different climate scenarios that we've talked about before that RCP 2.6, which is the rapidly addressing climate change, in which we expect the amount of permafrost to be um, roughly about 25% uh, less than it is today. Um, and then it just still um, gets worse from there with uh, the RCP 6.0, um, which is um, a little bit warmer than um, the Paris Climate um, Agreement um, goal, and then the, the business as usual um, 8.5 RCP, which is almost a complete loss of all permafrost, and that would be a, a very bad situation. You can see this in map view here. Um, this is RCP 2.6, um, and the gray area being the um, current extent and um, the green area being the predicted ex extent by the end of the century. Um, and you see that there's there's a large area that, um, that will likely um, melt and no longer have permafrost, but the amount of melted area significantly increases um, with the more severe climate scenarios until only areas around northern Canada and Greenland um, and small patches in Siberia will have permafrost and all of this gray area will be completely melted, which would have really dramatic effects on climate. Um, additionally, areas that have permafrost um, and are melting are really vulnerable to um, the land subsiding and you have this uneven melting that can um, wreak havoc on infrastructure such as these houses where uh, the permafrost is melted and therefore the ground has collapsed. Um, melted permafrost can't support as much weight and so these houses have, have been completely warped as a result. Uh, permafrost also has a positive feedback loop um, for more melting. Um, so we often consider permafrost being kind of a, a tipping point where you um, potentially could have more melting um, that is a self-perpetuating system for even more melting. Because as you melt permafrost, then um, more 
organic matter is able to um, decompose and um, form carbon dioxide and methane that gets released into the atmosphere. And those are greenhouse gases that can contribute to more warming and therefore more melting of the permafrost um, and more release of gases. And this is a continued process, a vicious cycle of, of more and more melting because of the release of CO2 and methane. We can see here, this is the concentration of um, methane that's being uh, emitted in uh, northern Alaska, and it's been steadily increasing um, as we have more and more melting. Um, and this is uh, really significant because methane, if you remember, has um, 25 times more potential um, to act as a greenhouse gas than CO2 does. So it's a very volatile um, uh, molecule in our atmosphere in terms of greenhouse gases. And so if we have permafrost that's emitting a lot of methane because it's being decomposed and melting, um, that could be a serious issue. We see here, this is the um, CO2 emissions from permafrost currently um, from a view from the North Pole. Um, and especially in areas of lower latitude where we have the most significant amount of melting right now, um, there's um, very large emissions of CO2 in those areas. So next, let's talk about groundwater. So groundwater is just water that's um, in soil spaces. Um, so all soil has pores um, and groundwater can fill up those pores. Um, and so you can kind of think of um, soil as being kind of a collection of these um, different particles and the spaces between them can fill with water. The, um, the line or the depth at which um, the ground is completely saturated with water, um, the top of that is called the water table. So above the water table, these pores are no longer saturated, and below the water table, these pores are saturated. Um, and the movement of water through soil is dictated by a value called the hydraulic conductivity. And different types of soil have different hydraulic conductivity, meaning they can move water through them more easily and therefore act as aquifers more easily. Um, soils such as um, gravel can have very high hydrologic conductivities, meaning that they water can move through them on the scale of centimeters to meters per second. Um, and then sand um, can move water at more closely related to about millimeters per second. And then clay in some is instances can take um, years for that water to, to move through an equivalent distance. Um, and so um, any time that you have a thick clay layer that can act as a kind of a boundary for further water movement. And we call that, that boundary a confining unit because um, groundwater has a very hard time uh, passing through that layer. When you have um, multiple confining units, uh, in between them, you can form a confined aquifer. So a confined aquifer has a, a um, low hydraulic conductivity layer both above and below it. And so um, as a result, you can have um, a pressure buildup in this layer. Um, whereas an unconfined aquifer is just sitting on top of uh, a confining unit and it doesn't have anything above it that um, would cause it to, to gain pressure. Um, if you drill a well into one of these layers, um, you can pump out that groundwater. Um, but importantly, um, if, you pump, if you drill into a confined aquifer, you can get what's called an artesian well, in which um, the top of your well is located 
at a lower level than the um, water table where that aquifer is being recharged. Uh, and if that is the case, your well will start to flow automatically and it will just pump out due to gravity and you don't have to actually pump it out yourself. Um, and because that water is under pressure and you're relieving that pressure and that water can flow up. Um, if you're drilling into uh, an unconfined aquifer um, or your um, well is um, drilled into a confined aquifer, but the top of your well is higher than the water table, then you won't have a artesian well. Um, and you'll just have a, a water table well where you'll have to pump the water um, up to the surface. Uh, now, when you're pumping water, you can um, form what's called a cone of depression. It's kind of a sad term, which um, I know many of you might be feeling like you're in a cone of depression right now due to everything going on. But a cone of depression is a groundwater hydrology term in which the water table sinks because um, you're pumping that water out um, and that area around it has its water removed faster than it can be recharged. Uh, and this can be a, a problem um, especially if you're um, on uh, an area that's close to the ocean um, and you can have salt water intrusion. So if you have a, a well where you're pumping out water, sometimes um, if you're close to the ocean, you can have salt water get sucked towards um, your well and it can... Um, contaminate that well. And once you have salt water that flows into your well, then it's pretty much um, not use, useful at all for um, uh, freshwater pumping and you kind of have to abandon that well um, or recharge it uh, with a lot of water. Um, so this can be a serious issue if you're, you're over pumping your well, then um, you might have salt water in, intrusion uh, occurring. Another issue with over pumping a well is subsidence. So um, when you pump water out of a well, um, then you're uh, increasing the pressure. You're actually squeezing the land um, as you're pumping it out, kind of like a sponge that you're, you're uh, squeezing in order to get that water out. Um, and as a result, um, that land can permanently compact sometimes. And you can see in this picture that um, the San Joaquin Valley in California has had significant amount of subsidence because the there's been so much groundwater compaction going on, uh, pumping um, that you have a lot of compaction of that soil. And so the soil level used to be all the way up here in 1925. And when this picture was taken in 1977, the ground had subsided this entire distance. So this is a significant issue, especially if you're near the coast and you're subsiding so that you're now being exposed to increased sea level. Um, so, um, and a lot of times when you have subsidence, that pore space that you lost can't be regained and you're losing that aquifer and that uh, potential to, in this case, water your crops. Um, we can see here in the map uh, the distribution of groundwater around the globe. Um, it can vary um, the, the depth at which um, the, that groundwater table is, um, can vary significantly. Um, some areas, such as in the, the Rockies, can have um, very, very thick water um, groundwater uh, aquifers, whereas some areas um, have almost none. Um, for example, in Australia, you have um, very little groundwater because it's so hot and it evaporates so quickly there. Um, of course, climate change comes into this um, as well. Um, with more climate change, you have more evaporation of soil moisture, and so it's harder to recharge groundwater aquifers. 
Um, and also with climate change, you're going to have more areas that are going to be water stressed and therefore people tend to pump more groundwater um, when they have less reliable sources such as um, a river supply of water. Um, and so here you can see the projected um, water stress um, to groundwater systems into the future. Um, and there's a, a drastic increase as we move into 2040 in an RCP 8.5 scenario where huge swaths of, especially in um, South uh, in Western United States, will be experiencing extreme levels of, of water stress um, with less water availability. So um, next, let's talk about um, plant uptake of water. So that's a, a big component of um, the hydrologic cycle is how plants themselves move water um, throughout their ecosystems. So um, trees can absorb a very significant amount of water and they can also produce their own weather. As you can see here that these trees that are transpiring or um, water being released from their their um, leaves, or in this case their pine needles, um, can release uh, a lot of water vapor um, in the form of fog. And so uh, a tree uptakes water um, from their roots and that water uh, moves up the stem or the trunk of a tree through um, narrow tubes of dead um, plant cells called xylem and um, that water moves up the xylem up the trunk uh, and eventually leaves um, out through um, holes in the leaves called stomata um, and this is how you get um, nutrients coming up from the soil and up through the the into the into the leaves for more growth of that tree is that it travels along this kind of river of water through the tree. So the tree can either open or close those stomata depending on um, whether it needs water at that time or how water stressed it is. If it's very water stressed, it will close its stomata so it can't have evaporation occurring from the leaves. Um, and when it's um, going through photosynthesis and absorbing um, water, then it'll open up those stomata. Um, so um, that leaves the question of uh, how do the trees actually do this? Um, so we'll watch this video um, to, to answer that question. Trees need to transport water from their roots up until their topmost branches in order to survive. And that is no trivial task. There is a limit to the height that water can be sucked up a tube. It's 10 meters. If you suck on a long vertical straw, the water will go no higher than 10 meters. At this point, there will be a perfect vacuum at the top of the straw and the water will start to boil spontaneously. For a tree to raise water 100 meters, it would have to create a pressure difference of 10 atmospheres. How would trees do that? When I posed this conundrum, a lot of people said the answer is transpiration. And that's when water evaporates from the leaf, pulling up the water molecules behind it. Now that's clearly a mechanism a tree can use to create suction, but it doesn't help us overcome this 10 meter limit. The lowest the pressure can go is a pure vacuum, which I imagine is not happening inside of tree leaves. Right? Right, Hank. So you might suspect that a tree does not contain continuous straw-like tubes. The tree effectively has valves in it. So you don't have a column of water. This big tube, which you're saying needs to be filled with water, is actually made up of cells. Although these are good speculations, they don't turn out to be correct. Scientists who study trees find that the xylem tubes that transport water do contain a continuous water column. So how else could the tree transport water from the roots to the leaves? They don't suck. They don't use a vacuum. Okay, so how do they do it? Squeezing like a cow, like you're squeezing a cow water all the way up. There's little, little tree <laughs> muscles in there. Yeah. Besides being a giant waste of energy, all of the cells that make up the xylem tubes are dead. What about osmotic pressure? If there is more solute in the roots than in the surrounding soil, water would be pushed up the tree. 
But some trees live in mangroves where the water is so salty that osmotic pressure actually acts in the other direction, so the tree needs additional pressure to suck water into the tree. Then it must be capillary action. The thinner the tube, the higher the water can climb. But the tubes in a tree are too wide. At 20 to 200 micrometers in diameter, water should rise less than a meter. So how do trees do it? Well, one of the assumptions we made is wrong. The lowest the pressure can go is a pure vacuum. Pure vacuum. Pure vacuum. In a gas, this is true. When you eliminate all of the gas molecules, the pressure is zero and you have a perfect vacuum. But in a liquid, you can go lower than zero pressure and actually get negative pressures. In a solid, we would think of this as tension. This means that the molecules are pulling on each other and their surroundings. As the water evaporates from the pores of the cell wall, they create immense negative pressures of minus 15 atmospheres in an average tree. Think about the air-water interface at the pore. There is one atmosphere of pressure pushing in and negative 15 atmospheres of suction on the other side. So why doesn't the meniscus break? Because the pores are tiny, only 2 to 5 nanometers in diameter. At this scale, water's high surface tension ensures the air-water boundary can withstand huge pressures without caving. As you move down the tree, the pressure increases up to atmospheric at the roots. So you can have a large pressure difference between the top and the bottom of the tree because the pressure at the top is so negative. But hang on, if the pressure at the top is negative 15 atmospheres, shouldn't the water be boiling? Yes, yes it should. But changing phase from liquid to gas requires activation energy. And that can come in the form of a nucleation site, like a tiny air bubble. That's why it's so important that the xylem tubes contain no air bubbles. And they can do this because unlike a straw, they've been water filled from the start. This way, water remains in the metastable liquid state when it really should be boiling. It's just like supercooled water remains liquid even though it should be ice. So you could say that the water in a tree is super sucked because it remains liquid at such negative pressures. And why are trees moving all this water up the tree? I want you to make a guess. Say it out loud. For photosynthesis? Actually, no. Less than 1% of the water is used in photosynthetic reactions. Any other ideas? Okay, what about growth? Well, 5% of the water is used to make new cells. Well, so what happens to the other 95% of the water? It just evaporates. For each molecule of carbon dioxide that tree takes in, it loses hundreds of molecules of water. Whoa. Can you believe how amazing this is? Trees create huge negative pressures of tens of atmospheres by evaporating water through nanoscale pores, sucking water up 100 meters in a state where it should be boiling but can't because the perfect xylem tubes contain no air bubbles just so that most of it can evaporate in the process of absorbing a couple molecules of carbon dioxide. I will never look at trees the same way again. Yeah, so trees are pretty remarkable uh, and they uh, create this extreme negative pressure in order to move water up through their trunks. So that's just one component of the, the hydrologic cycle and how um, trees partake in it and cause the, the fog that we saw at the start of that slide. Trees need to... Um, so next let's talk about wetlands. So um, wetlands are just areas in which groundwater is outflowing. Uh, and so you can see here that you have um, an area of groundwater movement and this area of wetland is having groundwater seeping out uh, and forming this, this wet area. There's a number of different zones in a wetland characterized by um, how flooded it is and the uh, vegetation that's present. You have the aquatic zone that's completely underwater, the emergent zone on the shorelines of wetted areas, um, the wetted meadow, which is um, just above the, the water line, up to shrubs and uh, trees in the upland area. And so the reason why you don't have trees um, in wetlands or in meadows is because trees generally cannot tolerate um, fully saturated soil and need a little bit of air space. Um, and so that's um, why they can only grow in their more upper regions. We can see here, this is a map of all the wetlands in the United States. They tend to be in low-lying areas um, near the coasts. Um, 
uh, and we can see um, that there's also um, a lot in um, these previously glaciated areas as well um, where you have a lot of um, uh, water on the, the surface as well as near the Mississippi River. Um, so within wetlands there's two different types of uh, surface water features um, that are good to know about. Um, there's bogs which are um, just pools of water that primarily form from rainfall or water flowing into them. Um, they don't have a lot of groundwater flowing into them and mainly have uh, an outflow of groundwater. And as a result, um, bogs have an accumulation of organic matter um, and generally a uh, acidic pH. Um, on the other hand, fens are predominantly fed by groundwater. And so they'll, they'll have both um, inflow from groundwater and surface floor flow, as well as outflow um, lower down and also stream flow outwards. And so they don't have that accumulation of organic matter and acidity quite as, as much. Uh, and um, fens tend to actually be um, alkaline or, or uh, more basic than um, bogs tend to be. Um, the reason why wetlands are so important is because they're an incredible um, ability to store carbon. Um, so every year, wetlands sequester enough CO2 um, to be equal to a billion barrels of oil. Um, so that's nothing to scoff at. Um, that's equivalent to um, one acre of mangroves being equivalent to 726 tons of coal. Um, and so to put that into perspective as well, that's the um, wetlands can bury carbon at rates 10 times greater than forests can just because um, the soil that they create is so rich in carbon. Um, and they can capture carbon at faster rates as well, um, two to four times faster. Uh, and so um, preserving wetlands and um, making sure that they grow is really important strategy for making sure that we reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and the growth of wetlands is um, definitely a suggestion that's been um, suggested by the IPCC in order to try to sequester as much uh, CO2 from the atmosphere as possible. Um, and yet we still have um, a lot of wetland loss um, this is due to an, a number of different reasons, and you can see here that the rate of loss is very heterogeneous. Um, it's not, not constant um, throughout um, the East Coast. Uh, and the, you can see that um, previously we were losing significantly more wetlands than we are now. Uh, and the reason for wetland loss is not really tied to climate change that much. Um, and it's instead um, mainly a result of land use change. And you can see that here, um, that the majority of wetland loss is actually due to silviculture, which is the, the growth of forests um, and um, growing, growing wood um, and for, for lumber industry. Um, but also for agriculture, you can see here, um, and just urban development as well. And so changes in um, how we allocated land has um, resulted in a lot of loss of, of wetland areas. And now that we see what the, the tremendous value of wetlands are, um, we have now acted to try to preserve them a little bit better. Um, that being said, with sea level rise, um, a lot of wetlands um, cannot adapt quickly enough and so they actually the wetlands can drown because they don't build up fast enough um, compared to how fast the sea level is rising so um, it's it's likely that we will will still see um, some significant losses of wetlands in the future um, another major component of 
uh, the hydrologic cycle are rivers and streams. Uh, I'll be talking much more extensively about rivers and streams. Um, we'll have two different lectures um, on them in the future, so I'll skip over them for now. Um, but just know that rivers are very cool and a, a, a big component of the hydrologic cycle. Um, next, we'll talk about lakes. So lakes are just a large bo water body surrounded by land. There's a beautiful one here. Um, there's a lot of different types of lakes. So this is Crater Lake in Oregon, um, formed um, at the top of a volcano that blew its top um, a few thousand years ago. Um, if you ever have a chance to go to Crater Lake, it's absolutely gorgeous. The water here is actually several thousand feet deep, and as a result, it has this beautiful blue color. Um, Additionally, uh, a lake can form through tectonic activity um, as two tectonic plates separate um, and form a rift. Um, that rift zone can be filled with water as it is here in Iceland, um, and you can form a lake, usually a, a very deep lake as well. Um, additionally, um, you have areas um, that have been previously glaciated uh, covered in a glacier, um, and you can have a lot of lakes develop in that region, um, such as kettle ponds, which we'll talk about uh, more in a later lecture as well. Um, a lot of times you can have a lake um, develop um, at the terminus of a glacier. That's called a proglacial lake. Um, you have a d deposition of sediment at the edge of a glacier, and that acts as a dam um, to store um, water that comes out of the glacier as it melts. And so especially in, in or for glaciers that end on land instead of the ocean, you can have a, a lake develop in the, at the terminus. Another type of lake is a landslide lake. So um, if you have a river flowing down a mountain and you have a big landslide that blocks that that river um, it can act as a dam and it can stop the flow of that river um, and form a lake as you can see here uh, the next type of lake is called an oxbow lake as you can see right here um, it's a, an oxbow lake is formed by a river meander um, like this one that gets cut off and abandoned. And so you can have this kind of horseshoe shaped um, lake that's that's left behind as the river takes a, a new course. Um, of course, there's artificial lakes and reservoirs that we um, intentionally make um, in order to store water and, and reduce flooding. Um, and there's meteoric lakes. This is a lake in Siberia um, where a, a meteor struck and has since um, filled with rainwater. And you have a, a lake here that's fairly circular as a result. Um, also, um, glaciers tend to carve out areas of a mountainside. And if they melt away, they can form what's called a tarn or a cirque lake um, where um, they have over deepened uh, their valleys. And so as a, a small glacier um, carves away and removes sediment as it, the ice grinds against the, the rock, um, if that ice then melts away, it'll leave this area here where it can fill with water um, and form a lake. And then there's oases, which we'll talk more about um, when we um, talk about deserts. But oases are areas of deserts in which you have groundwater outflow. And so you have an area of, in the mountains where you have groundwater recharge that's going into a confined aquifer. And that water then flows and percolates um, until that aquifer reaches the surface or it reaches um, a crack or a, um, some sort of crevice um, where that water can flow up and form an oasis. So oases are, always have to be supported 
by a groundwater um, source because the evaporation rate in the desert is so high. Um, besides the, these different types of lakes, there's um, we can classify lakes as either oligotrophic or eutrophic. So oligotrophic lakes are um, fairly clear. They have um, low nutrient supplies. Um, and so they're generally the lakes that you would picture of a, a lake that you'd want to swim in. Um, they're very, very nice and pretty. Um, but they, they tend to support um, larger fish as well. Um, whereas eutrophic lakes um, have a very large amount of nutrients that are being fed to it. Um, for some, sometimes that's nutrients that are supplied from fertilizer that's um, being washed into the lake. And as a result, you can have a lot of growth of bacteria and mosses and, and plant life um, that um, decrease the clarity of that water and, and um, change the ecosystem that develops in that lake. Um, it's not, not quite as pleasant if you're to, to swim in it. Additionally, um, there's saline lakes, so um, lakes that are salty. This is Mono Lake in Eastern California. Um, and so saline lakes are formed whenever a lake does not have an outlet stream. Um, and the water that enters it can only leave via evaporation, um, such as the, the Great Salt Lake is an example of this as well. Um, where there's no outlet stream and everything just evaporates, leaving behind higher concentrations of salt. And actually, in terms of volume, um, saline lakes uh, take up as much volume almost as freshwater lakes, um, or at least large ones. And that's mainly because the Caspian Sea is considered a lake because it's surrounded by land in all sides and it's a very large water body. Um, but also um, there's a lot of very large freshwater lakes such as the largest freshwater lake, um, Lake Baikal, um, as well as um, these other lakes including Lake Superior. Um, and then the smaller lakes that we see um, only make up a very small portion of the total volume of water um, that's contained in lakes. So we can see here, this is the density of lake area uh, throughout the world. So for each pixel, how, how, what percentage of that pixel is um, taken up by um, surface water. Uh, and we can see that there's generally higher um, densities of lakes in the Arctic. And that's because you have all of these different um, types of lakes that can form in uh, previously glaciated areas. As the, the glacier recedes, um, then you leave behind an area that's very prone to um, surface water um, collection. Uh, and so you have a lot of lakes in the Arctic. You also have a lot of lakes around major rivers. So you can see here, this is the Mississippi River and the, um, uh, the Nile River here, where you have um, a lot of oxbow lakes as well um, that we, we just talked about. So there's lakes all over the world, um, and they um, are formed by different processes, but you can see that um, they're, they're definitely a big component of the hydrologic cycle. All right, that just about wraps things up. Um, in summary, we co covered different processes such as evaporation and transpiration within the hydrologic cycle. We talked about oceans and the thermal hailing circulation that, that drives its, its movement. We talked about tides um, and atmospheric rivers. Um, we talked about the cryosphere, glaciers and sea ice. Um, we talked about snow cover, um, permafrost, and how it's being affected by climate change. We talked about groundwater and plant uptake of water. And then lastly, we've talked about just now about wetlands and lakes. Um, 
So thanks everyone for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you all at the next lecture.